Center for Alternative Economics is moving on to its third day on the international seminar topic Higher Education in a Developing Economy, Problems, Policies and Perspectives. This is the second conference organized by the Center. The last two days of the seminar was indeed a very successful one with warm responses and expertise view on the respective topics. This session that is the technical session number seven has some changes which has been displayed on the uh, slide. Uh, the session uh, will be chaired by Professor Sriyak Matthews and the speaker will be Professor Shaman Chattopadhyay. Before starting with the technical session, we shall have the moment to be more auspicious. I welcome uh, Ms. Gopika Varma for the prayer. session number seven. Uh, the session will be chaired by Professor Suryat Matthews, Fellow, Institute for Sustainable Development and Governance, Tiruvananthapuram. And we have Professor Shaman Chattopadhyay from Jawaharlal Nehru University as the key speakers. I invite all the dignitaries to the dais. This session will be having two presentations by Dr. Arunji Lal, Head, Department of Economics, Government Arts College, and by Dr. C. Anil Kumar, Research Officer, Kerala State Planning Board. For offering us all a cordial welcome, I invite Ramya Mohan. A pleasant good morning to all respected delegates of the, on the dais, off the dais, dear teachers, and my dear friends. Uh, it's great pleasure to welcome you all to the seventh technical session of the uh, international seminar. We have uh, this session deals with the financing of higher education uh, in India. Note that financing of higher education in India is a complicated uh, issue in uh, in in the present uh, scenario. Uh, to chair this session, we have uh, Dr. Sirek Matthews, and uh, for. Uh, uh, President of the paper, uh, the main speaker is uh, Professor uh, Salman Chadapatiya, and we have two presenters in this session. Uh, Dr. Sirik Matthew is a fellow in Institute for Sustainable Development, Governance, in Toronto. Uh, he was former Deputy Director of Collegiate Education, Government of Kerala. He specializes in the field of energy economics and higher education. Uh, he has 33 years of teaching experience. He has contributed several articles and research journals, uh, and he is actively involved in research programs. On the behalf of the Center, University of Kerala, I uh, offer a hearty welcome to you, sir. We have right person to discuss about the financing of higher education in India. Uh, that is uh, Professor uh, Salman Chadopadhyay, who is an eminent educational economist. Uh, I extend a special and warm welcome to you, sir. 
then I would like to extend a warm welcome to the delegates of the dais. A hearty welcome to you all. It's a honor to it's, it's a honor itself to honor a beautiful audience. I welcome you all to this uh, seventh se technical session. Once again, I will I welcome you all to this seventh uh, technical session. Thank you and have a nice day. Now we shall begin with the technical session. I request the chair to continue with the proceedings. Thank you, Ramya, for the kind words. A uh, very good morning to all of you. We are here with a very important technical session, an aspect of higher education, that financing higher education. Before we talk anything about the financing aspect of higher education, in my view, it is imperative to foreground certain issues. At least there are two issues very important in the planning of higher education in India and it's a factor in Kerala. Point number one is that higher education in India has been experiencing tremendous unprecedented changes over the past two decades. This has been occasioned by the general regime of globalization and the evolution of the concept of knowledge economy. And in this process, higher education has worked in tandem with social evolution. We find a remarkable kind of heterogeneity creeping into the hitherto relatively homogeneous pack of higher education. Say some two decades back, nobody used to question what was happening in higher education. Now we find the marginalized sections coming into higher education because of the social evolution and questions are being asked. These questions need to be answered on an objective scale. Higher education or education in campuses has come to assume the role of discussion points and not forms of, uh, I put in commas, catechism. It should not be the place where questions are asked, irrelevant questions are asked, and irrelevant answers are offered. So this is a contestation between two groups. One, the firmly entrenched agencies of education, and two, the kind of castes and classes that were hitherto ignored in higher education places. This is point number one. Point number two is the emergence of the public and private sectors competing each other. That is also a remarkable change which has happened in India during the course of the two decades. And this has also been consequent on the globalized regime. In Kerala especially we find the mushrooming of self-financing colleges. Somebody calls it student-financed colleges. It is not self-financing. So a lot of ethical issues are there, a lot of academic issues are there. So we have to foreground these two aspects before talking anything about financing of education or talking about the restructuring of higher education in India and also especially in Kerala. And regarding financing, normally students of economics know how to calculate the worthwhileness of a certain financing project. You more often talk in terms of costs and benefits. But in education, no major work, no major analytical work has been done in the case of, with regard to measuring of benefits from higher education. What is the measuring load of education? Lot of work has been done in regard to primary education or in regard to enrollment. You speak in terms of quantitative enrollment. That is a measuring load of the success of education. No major work has been done in regard to higher education. Possibly I happen to read one article which came in EPW. If I remember right, that is February 2016 by two others, and uh, Mm, I forgot the second name. So the end, uh, 
both from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, who did a study on measuring the benefits of higher education, correlating the whole issue with agricultural productivity. So that is very important. What is the actual benefit? In regard to human resource, it is very hard to gauge the benefit of higher education because that is not a material thing. But indirectly, we can correlate it with the agricultural productivity as has been done by these two others. In Kerala, possibly we can do it in respect of um, the, the quality of teaching itself, benefits of higher education. That will be some kind of an input-output analysis. The input itself becoming the output and the output re-entering the input category. So such works have to be done um, in the course of time. And this forum should be a place where fresh avenues of thinking have to emerge. I'm not taking a lot of time because that is not my business. I'm very happy to welcome Professor Salman Chalobhyaya of the JNU, who will be talking on the mode of funding higher education. Can it reform university governance? And after that, there will be two presentations, one by Arunjit Lal, your president, who is the head of the Department of Economics, Government Arts College, Trivandrum, who will be talking on higher education and labor market in India, the missing linkages, and the second presentation shall be done by Dr. C. N. Kumar, who is a research officer working with the Kerala State Planning Board. I welcome the panelists, and uh, I very cordially welcome Professor Salman to deliver the keynote address. Professor. Respected uh, Chair, Professor Matthews, uh, the, my dear students, faculty from various colleges and universities, government officials. And uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm really grateful to Professor Salim for giving me the opportunity to share my understanding <coughs> on something which uh, I'm still grappling with. And, uh, you know, I think Professor Matthews uh, has made my task a little difficult because at the end of my lecture, I'm not too sure whether I can address some of the concerns, some of the research questions that he has proposed or he has raised before us. Uh, <clears throat> what I intend to do in my uh, presentation, I would begin with what is the relationship between excellence and university governance. I will briefly share with you the understanding of the factors which are behind university failure by Adam Smith, Beblin, and Buchanan in particular. Then I will move on to the funding issue and what are the different modes of funding and what impact the different modes of funding would have on university governance and then I tend to conclude. It's a PPT of the paper in the making so in the process you will see that I'm still trying to understand how we can link the two. To uh, begin with let me briefly share with you uh, what do you do in economics of education? Uh, economics of education is not generally offered in the master's program in the majority of the Indian universities. That is not the case in the West. Economics of health is indeed offered and when you go to the library, when you search materials, you will get quite a good number of materials in the area of economics of health, but not so for economics of education. What we do, I mean, I'm primarily talking to the students. Uh, we apply what we learn in economics in this particular sector of education. And the underlying assumptions of what we do in economics, therefore, are assumed to be or supposed to be valid when you are applying in this particular field. So when you're looking at the policy making, what you will find that the policy making is increasingly being informed world over, not only in India, world over. India is merely emulating what is happening in the West by the economic principles that we learn in the subject of economics. And here lies the problem because 
the application of economic principles in the area of edu in the area of education very often we say it's a neoliberal approach to the policy reform but before we critique neoliberalism i must urge that you first diagnose the problem and why the neoliberals uh, are gaining upper hand in the policy making world over not merely by saying the neoliberals would ruin the education system but why are they coming in such a big way there is a political economy question economic theory as well as the polity both have to be understood to understand why they are making inroads into the policy making so uh, there would be implications and this is what i'm trying to do university is a societal ins is institution so one of the two oldest institutions other than the church an university has been responding to the challenges as already professor matthews has mentioned university is evolving is responding to the challenges and universities are located within a context and that is why in order to assess how a university is catering to the needs of the society we, are, we must understand what is the mission of a university and how the university is responding to the challenges if i may quote from massey uh, uh, a researcher in the area of microeconomics who applies a quite a deal of microeconomics in the field of university financing and cost universities are among the world's most complex organizations they produce multiple and nuanced output very often university is modeled as a multi product form there is no one single output q is a function of k and l the q is a vector and is very very difficult to measure q use highly specialized and often autonomous inputs the inputs are the students and the teachers other than the infrastructure that you have and the the most important component of the inputs the students and the teachers are actually optimizing decision making agents that make the functioning of the university challenges for the principals and the vice principals and the vice chancellor very very difficult because you are dealing with the people who are self interest driven utility maximizing individual like teachers and the students that is not true for the firm and pursue non profit goals what is the goal is very difficult education is not for business so the private sector also on paper not maximizing profit but still we say the private sector ought to be efficient why what is the objective function that is driving the private sector same question is valid for us in the publicly funded university system that what is the objective function objective function would be very often is conceptualized in terms of values which are very difficult to measure uh that are not easily quantified or even described coherently in subjective terms they use complex and esoteric production methods operate in competitive and dynamic markets so that is why when you are trying to apply economics of education in the field of higher education we are locating now we are located within the realm of universities it's a very very difficult task see there are two pillars of economics of education one is the human capital theory and second is the application of input output analysis in the realm of education these are the two pillars main pillars of economics of education so right now we are the second that is we are located within the university system some of the points professor matthews had already mentioned that what are the changes we witness which are bring about the change which are bringing about the changes in the university system generally you must have listen to professor tilak on the first day though i was not present first question that we need to address as a student of economics that whether higher education is a public good or some kind of mixed good if not a private good what kind of good primary education is because unless we deal with this question of categorization of education as a student of economics we cannot proceed further generally generally school education primary education up to class 8 should be considered as a merit good the way masgrave has defined we don't we don't depend on the consumer sovereignty 
for the delivery of the goods and services, merit good. It deserves merit, it merits attention from the society. Higher education ought to be a public good, but in practice it is a mixture of private as well as public. Because both the features of a typical pure public good as Samuelson has defined in 1954 article, non-rivalry in consumption and non-excludability. It is higher education, access to higher education, good institutions are rival thus in nature. So the first feature is not automatically satisfied and we can be excluded from the university system. So therefore, we generate externalities despite being a private good. So that's why it's a mixture of private and the public good. So the question is that when the government is taking a decision, true for India as well, to cut funding on higher education, it is the publicness of higher education are getting compromised, right? So this is important. Second, already been mentioned, is a knowledge-based economy. You have listened to yesterday also that how knowledge-based economy is also bringing about a change in the university system. And higher education now is a global public good. We have to cross the boundaries and see that how the publicness of higher education are crossing the international borders. It's a global public good. And that would also put pressure on the policy making. That would also bring about changes the way university is functioning, getting more and more accountable to the society, already been mentioned. Right? So how we can be more accountable to the society, how we can address the challenges the society is faced with. And in the process, what has happened of the new liberal policy making, the knowledge is being commoditized. Knowledge is a commodity. It's a, it's a debatable. Let me uh, very briefly in a couple of sentences tell you. When you are talking about patenting, knowledge in the form of a patent is a private good. You are pay, you are excluded. If you don't pay, you can't. It's an article in a journal which you can't download because you have to pay, you have to be a member, subs subscriber of that particular journal. It becomes a private good. The same commodity, if it is a downloadable without paying for it, it becomes a public good. Right? So the public and the pri private, publicness and privateness of a particular commodity as Samuelson said in 1954, it's not a technical feature of a commodity, it's a policy decision, it's a construct, it's a socio-political construct, it's a, it's, a it's, a, it's a technology, it's a policy decision. So what has happened therefore, it is the purpose of the policy makers, it is the objective of the policy, the objective, the vision, the mission of the policy makers to understand how to treat knowledge here. Knowledge could be private, knowledge could be a global public. Generally the formula that we do, all the classics that we read, all are treated to be public good, but not all articles. And then, in the globalized era, we are increasingly forming networks. We are collaborating within the country, across the country, and network formation and collaboration, because as Professor Bharat Prashad was also mentioning yesterday, that the innovations are taking place, new ideas are generating, where the disciplines meet, right? So you can have interdisciplinarity, you can have transdisciplinarity, and so therefore we are forming network all over the world to deal with the challenges, and these are the changes which are very important to understand the university governance. The father of economics, 1776, the wealth of nations. Should I remove Uh, generally, we read the wealth of nations for and the father of economics, Adam Smith, the invisible hand, the butcher, and the baker, and everything. But in the same book, he has talked about the university failure. He was in Glasgow University, and he was visiting Oxford and Cambridge, 1760, 1770, right? And after returning to Glasgow, he was trying to uh, understand why Oxford and Cambridge in those days were not delivering the way they should have done. And Smith, in his typical style, right, is the father of economics and rate editing, in a typical style, he diagnosed the university failure in terms of these two. 
student consumer sovereignty and competition amongst the faculty to attract the best of the students. According to Adam Smith, if the students could pay with their tuition fees, the remunerations of the faculty, then you are creating a market between the student and the teacher and the market is essential for quality because the teachers would become more accountable to the students and students would be very serious, they are well informed, they know what, what are they doing, in what and how are they engaged, the dedication and uh, seriousness and so therefore they would get the best from the, 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 the teachers who are now the providers. So if you can construct a market between the student and the teachers and students are very, very serious in order to get the best from the teachers from the university system because they know what does education mean and what can education do to their future, then automatically the quality of education would improve and let the faculty, let the teachers also compete among themselves for attracting the best of the students. So it is the market, it is the notion of competition, if they are lacking, the university would fail to deliver. That was myth. Then we have got Veblen. Uh, Veblen were again trying to understand the failure of the university in the context of EWS, saying that the, 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 the teachers, the administrators, there is generally self-interest driven and ideally the university system should be engaged in a disinterested pursuit of knowledge and the university should satisfy the efficiency in the knowledge generation. And it does not happen when the teachers and the administrators and even the students are self-interest driven, they exercise their discretion which are inimical to the realization of quality the university should supposed to deliver. Business values and practices are imbibed, are infused into the functioning of the university system and that is the beginning of the crash of the university system. Bukhanan, the, the Nobel laureate, uh, you know, the three points that he said about why does a university fail are quite interesting. Then you will see that why it is very, very difficult for us to apply economics as a discipline in the realm of education and then we are talking about how the university would deliver. First, the taxpayers, we are here because the taxpayers are funding this seminar in a way. So taxpayers have no control over the universities, students do not pay. In fact, they hardly pay and no control over what they get. And third, teachers are not selling their services and so therefore they are not dependent on the market. If they are not faced with the competition in the market because the teachers are paid by the University Grants Commission, for example, in the context of India, who are they accountable to? Are they facing the market? If not, what is the most important challenge? How to motivate the teachers to deliver? Now, look at the second question, the students do not pay. Now, here lies the problem. In education, students are not the clients, no matter what Buchanan has said, no matter what Adam Smith has said. The problem is the students cannot buy the degrees. Students are the co-producers of knowledge. In the classroom, in the lab, teachers and the students walk together to realize excellence. Right? Teachers have a role to play to enthuse, to motivate the students and students similarly should also motivate the teachers. Without them the system is not a factory, it's, 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 it's not a shop where you can pay and get the certificate, you have to earn that certificate. And that makes quite a lot of difference between education and all other sectors where you can go and pay the product that you want to purchase, here you cannot. You have to go through the process of two years of PG and then you earn a degree. You have to earn it. You can't pay for it. You can only pay for getting an access into the university system, but you can't buy the degrees. And that makes a hell lot of a difference and we must remember this. But these are the problems that, you know, typical economist way of looking at why does a university fail. But quality of education, there are three major objectives in the 11 five-year plan. We had expansion inclusion and excellence. Other than employability, Mr. Shoshi Tharu, the ex-minister would be very often talking about the fourth objective of higher education. But expansion and inclusion would not mean much 
unless excellence is realized. Excellence is a prerequisite, right? And why excellence has been a problem? We can produce fantastic cars, cell phone, and what not, if we can import the technology here, right? Or we can generate the technology here. But, it, but, but when it comes to education, it has been a daunting challenge for the policymakers, for all of us. Honorable President Mr. Mukherjee would be almost visiting uh, the universities, private and public, main, mainly private, and he would be saying that we don't feature in the global ranking of the universities. So if you take the uh, ranking as an approximate proxy for the university output, then why is it difficult for the universities to produce excellence? Right? It's very, very difficult. And in the process, you will see that why it is difficult. Generally, there are two factors I find, and they are, again, getting reflected in the approach of the policymakers. One, though the neoliberals are advocating marketization of education, or construction of a quasi-market, or whatever, I will have occasion to give you some details about it in later. No matter what they say, as I said, it's very, very difficult to conceptualize a market for education. If you go, if, if your benchmark is a perfect competition and then proceed towards imperfect competition and all, it's very difficult. And there is no technology in the production function. That's why we can produce the best of the cell phones and uh, laptops, assemble or do whatever. You can produce the best of the cars. It doesn't matter where Canon or Nikon, the camera factories are located. You go by the brand name and you will get Canon and Nikon. But if Harvard is located not in US but some other countries, you will be asking question that is the same Harvard there, same MIT there, right? So why, why it is a problem? Because there is no technology which can convert the input to output. It's very, very difficult. There is no technology as such. And in order to deal with this problem, that there is no market, truly speaking, and there is no technology, very clearly defined technology, input-output relationship. If you look at the approach of the policymakers, there are just two major approaches, the way I feel it. One is to achieve what we call allocative efficiency in the context of an education market. That means you need a market. Market, some sort of a market. That's why we call it a quasi-market. We can't have perfect competition. That is a very ideal kind of market where just a couple of examples exist in the real world. But we are thinking about a market where some semblance of market competition, some semblance of input, uh, students, faculty interaction and all. So yesterday also, Professor Rajan Gurukul was talking about a regulatory body, if you remember, independent regulatory authority of higher education or the National Commission of Higher Education and Research. That if we develop a market, then we need a regulatory authority. Because the market of not a textbook which prevails, which would prevail, even if you cons even if you very try very hard to construct such a market. And the third and the second dimension of the policy making is to realize what we call technical efficiency. That means there is no input output function, truly speaking, the way we do it in micro, but let us have a technical, uh, let us have an input output well defined function because that is a prerequisite for achieving the quality. And both allocative efficiency and technical efficiency, they go together. So w when you are coming up with a market, you would expect the publicly funded universities to respond to the market forces, right? So they, they go together and in technical efficiency, there are two examples what the government has been trying to do. One is the performance-based assessment system and API, Ashna and others talked about it yesterday. And public-private partnership is also one way of reforming the governance structure of the universities. So these are the two major policy approaches. You may not read uh, properly uh, this, uh, you know, what is on the screen, but this is a university system where on the left hand side, on the right hand side, you have the input. And what are the input? The human resources and the physical infrastructure and both are obtained by spending resources. So, so uh, human resources and the physical infrastructure and on your, on your left is the university output. Now, what is so crucial about the production function 
when you are applying in the case of university is that if and since there is no technology where you can put the input in and the output will be automatically churned out as per specification it doesn't happen so the if is very important and if is nothing but the process where teachers and the students are involved with dedication with motivation to convert the input to output very often in university is said to be a customer input technology as well as already been mentioned by professor mathews that the students are the input and students are the output and students are the customers is very very important to bring students into the entire process so what happens here in the process you have got a couple of things that autonomy incentives governance the bureaucracy how we are getting suffocated by the bureaucracy or the bureaucracy is helping us to do what we want to do the governance and the incentive system and all these process all these dimension of the process are very very important when you are talking about conversion of input to the output but as i said very briefly in the beginning of my presentation that when we critique the new liberals you have to understand why are they gaining when it comes to the policy making it's very very important not merely by saying the new liberal would ruin the system they are but why you see the hallmark of the academia the university system is the academic freedom that we enjoy that the freedom and that is very very important because we are supposed to be the specialist we know what we should do not only in terms of the designing of the course curriculum in terms of the delivery and so therefore we should be given the utmost freedom from the bureaucracy from the university grants commission because we know what we are doing right and is a typical weblenian uh, world where we are engaged in the disinterested pursuit of knowledge but what is the reality the reality is that despite liberalization despite the private sector entry despite the fact that we are gradually embracing a market we have not been able to deliver quality so the market and the private sector participation have not delivered quality on the other hand the publicly funded institutions where we are being funded by the university grants commission we have not been also delivered the quality but the factors behind that too are quite different in the private sector what has happened that it's as i said it's very difficult to say that private sector would have achieved efficiency in the use of the resources they don't maximize profit on paper what they do they minimize the cost they inflate the cost on in a very unfair corrupt manner and then they siphon out the surplus now in education what happens and is equally true for health that the cost and the quality are positively related so if you cut cost you are compromising with the quality you are compromising with the salaries being given to the teachers you are compromising with the infrastructure that you install to get the best of the quality and this cost cutting tendency coupled with the students craze for the certificate that the certificate is important not the process has actually hijacked the indian higher education system so its private sector has become majority of them it's a pyramid there are good universities i'm not saying anything against some of the good universities but the majority of them have actually failed to deliver quality because of this because there is no market and the students are happy with the certificate and when they realize the certificates are of little value after entering the job market then it's too late because the decision that we take in education are irreversible choices we we can't go back because the years are all gone by you have to change the discipline is not a buying of a piece of land or buying a cell phone that if you don't like you approach olx right you, you sell it off second hand you 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 simply can't do it's a history it's embodied in you and you can't negate can't erase the past in the public sector there is also a serious problem we need to introspect we need to reflect what we are doing starting from the teaching learning process that we have in the classroom doing justice to the curriculum that we design to deliver to you the paper setting the conduct of the examination paper evaluation teacher absenteeism and all research supervision who are the examiners of your thesis political appointment of the vice chancellors inefficient use of resources there are actually quite a good number of them but we must think because what happens here as i said the process is so nuanced and so subtle so esoteric 
that is very difficult to ensure that what is the best. And the moment we lack scruples, the moment we are dishonest, right, we are very quick to achieve our target, then the process is subverted, that the process is compromised, and poor quality of education is generated, knowingly, unknowingly. This is very, very serious. So both the public and the private sector has failed to deliver, majority of them, precisely because of this reason. That if there were a technology, we would have no problem whatsoever. Now, so therefore, the moment you take higher education as a quasi-public good, that means there is a private demand, there is a social demand, and the, dis and the difference between the private and the social demand is the extent of externalities. Already been mentioned, it is very difficult to quantify externalities. So when you are talking about 4% of GDP, 6% of GDP, 3% of GDP, one simple crude way of answering this question would be how much of public funding, right? And that would be answered by a quantification of externalities, which is a stupendous task. So the question is therefore that, okay, funding is important because of the massification, because of the infrastructure need, but we are also aware of the fact that the universities are failing to deliver quality. So how can we tackle with the board that we have to release more funding for the university system? At the same time, can we effect, can we bring about a change in the university governance system? to deliver quality. And here lies the importance of the mode of funding. That the, the way the funding is released to the university system is very, very important here thereby. And there are two ways of to talk about the mode of funding. This is John Glow, uh, 2007. He is distinguishing between the two. What is it that funded? Is it input based or output based? Simple. When university goes to UGC to negotiate for funding, what UGC does, how many teachers you have, what is the cost, the input, then negotiated and fund is released. If in the discussion the performance of the university, the output of the university does not feature, then it is an input based funding. Right now what, what we have is an input based funding. But we can have output based funding. And the fund would be released based on the performances. And a part of the UGC funding is also output-based funding. The departments compete with other departments for DRS, for CAS, for DSA. There are three different, CAS is the highest one. We also compete for funds the university keeps aside for university for potential excellence, UPE funds. So there are additional funds for output based, but mainly it is the input based funding. And I will explain it a little later, but what implications does it have? And second, how is it funded? Is it funded through the UGC based on UGC uh, based on the, uh, the centralized agency, or is it decentralized? That means the market would be brought into the picture when the funding is released. In this diagram, you have the vertical line in the mid, in the middle. You have how is it funded from regulated approach? UGC is giving money directly to the universities, or it is giving money when the universities are responding to the market. The decentralized version a voucher system is one, right? So I'll talk about it. And on your left is the input orientation, the present system, and on your right is the output orientation. So there are four quadrants, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4, and some combination of these would be very, very important. Why we are talking about uh, mode of funding? Because each way, when you are moving from Q1 to Q2, Q3, and Q4, we are trying to do two things. One, how to motivate the students and the teachers to produce output, so the funding would be released because the market does not exist. In a competitive market, what happened? The corporates would be vying for a larger share in the market. And since there is no market as such, right? So the university would release the money if we perform well, right? So therefore, output based funding means we become accountable, right? In a pre designated manner. And that is a problem. And the second is that how the students would be also coming into the picture when 
they will play a very important role to uh, to to assess the university funding now when we are moving from therefore input based funding to output based funding the logic is very clear that when we are moving towards the output based funding you are asking the university you are urging the university to deliver if you deliver we will give you more funds if you don't deliver we will not give you more funds in a way that is trying to energize the system trying to motivate the people because as i said if there is no market and teachers are paid directly by the university grants commission theoretically speaking the teachers need not be worried about what they do so the source of the motivation here is very very important so when you are moving from input and process control to output control there are three conditions the university grants commission would like to ensure one that the management would be very very professionalized in the sense that we are professional people we are being funded we have to deliver that some sort of contractual agree agreement would be reached between the faculty and the vice chancellor the principal and the university and the university grants commission you have to look at how efficiency in the use of resources are achieved and third is the increased accountability so what is happening now in the university system the governance is actually multi level one we are accountable to the nac quality assurance we are also accountable in a way though we are debating to what extent we are to the gats in a globalized regime we are accountable to the an institutional mechanism located within the university internal quality assessment cell so who are we accountable to iqac located within the university to the nac university as a whole to the gats so the governance is very complicated in the in, when it comes to the university and when we are moving from input to the output the task is also very difficult how do you define university output it depends on the mission of the university and how the output is measured is also a signal what does mhd want the university to deliver and accordingly is giving a signal to the university that you better produce in accordance with the national institutional ranking framework you have got the global ranking framework there are various agencies and the vector differs the way the output is measured so when you are setting a target for us we are trying to gear up to respond to to achieve that target and that output is very very important so therefore in the process what happens the question is how are the teachers incentivized and how the state is trying to become an evaluative state now the state this is a typical new level of logic that look i am going to be a facilitator i am going to be a regulator quasi market means there has to be a regulator right it's not full fledged market the new liberals are never saying full fledged market because they understand that's a difference between liberalism and new liberalism they understand that full fledged typical market cannot be envisaged cannot be constructed so we are talking about a regulator definitely so when you are moving from input based funding to the output based funding what we are doing essentially i might skip the some slides because you know because i'm still in the process of making my slides so the argument might uh, move to and fro so when you are moving from input based funding to the output based funding what's happening input based funding means the input are being funded by the ugc so output is not being taken into account and so therefore bukanan and others would come and say that look the quality would be a problem so what happens in this system that is the prevalent system that you combine input based funding with api kind of system that means the output is defined as it is in the gazette of india there have been several revisions of the ugc regulation now those who are doing infill phd there is also a ugc regulation 2016 you might be knowing and i don't know whether it is discussed in the context of university and see that lot of conditions have been added and why publication is necessary in a journal not in a book being debated in jnu that if you before you submit your thesis you should have a publication in, in a journal not in a book we discussed in the ace meeting that why not book because ugc thinks that publication in a book is much easier than a publication in a journal 
But the question remains that the journals are also proliferating and there are dubious quality journals. Anyway, that's a problem with the UGC, maybe at the end of the lecture. But what is important here that uh, input based funding is being combined with a typical API system that is the present system. Now, when you are moving from the input to the output, as I said, how do you output, how do you measure output is very, very important. The day I, I was coming to uh, Tiruvananthapuram, day uh, before yesterday, uh, our minister for higher education, Mr. Javedkar, he uh, gave a press statement saying that you know the universities who are doing very well in terms of the national institutional ranking framework would be given the autonomy. This is the first step. Within a couple of years, you will see that these universities will also be given autonomy in terms of funding. Right? Autonomy means you have proved your credibility. You are on the top of the ranking list. You know what has to be delivered. So I give you the autonomy. This is about the Indian universities. At the same time, NHRD is very keen to pursue with the logic of setting up of world class universities. And world class universities, there has been a several instances reported in the Delhi newspaper that the files have been moving back and forth from MHRD law to the president of India. And the PUMO is very, very involved. PUMO wants freedom to be given to the world class universities in terms of the recruitment of the faculty in whatever they do. right? Because the reason is that the existing set of universities have failed to deliver, have failed to feature in the world ranking. So, they are irreparable. Mm -hmm. I am putting it very bluntly, sorry. They are beyond repair. So, if you want to feature in the world ranking of the universities, we have to think of universities anew, afresh. And that is why you give them complete freedom to whatever they want to do in terms of the admission of the students, in terms of the faculty recruitment, the foreign faculty recruitment will now be permitted, everything that they do. So, that means you are moving from input to the output based with freedom, with autonomy, the manner in which they, so that means it leads to increased autonomy. Uh, then, you know, when you are going back to this uh, particular diagram, you will see in the Q3, there is a mixture of output orientation and decentralized I may not discuss each and everything here, but here it is a typical example where universities are invited to submit tenders with specific mention about output, student and research, and there is a competition of fund. The way we purchase from the market by floating tender, UGC will also be floating tender. I am joking, UGC may not do in the near future, but I am saying the regulatory body will be floating tenders, and you have to say that we can produce student, we can produce research at a competitive cost, then the funds will be allocated among the universities. This is what the new regular logic is, that you generate competition and in the process of competition what happens, we motivate ourselves to deliver the best. Because if you do not address the question of motivation, the question of new liberal market, they do not count much. What the market system does? The market system makes us stand on our toes all the time, we have to deliver, right? So, that is a competitive spirit the new liberals would seek to inculcate. And in the fourth system, you have, where is it the fourth system? In the fourth system, you have the voucher system, right? And there was a question yesterday, some discussion yesterday that the students would be given that financial entitlement. And this is a very wonderful Friedman logic. I am saying wonderful without critiquing Friedman. So that look, higher education needs public support, understand, understandable. And second, university fails to deliver. So, combine the two, you have got a voucher system. That means you support, but the support has to come back to the university system through the students. In the process, what you do? You construct a market. So, the questions that we need to answer is that how the voucher system, what would be the amount, who will be getting the voucher, whether the fees would be regulated or deregulated. It is a very important question. Fees are deregulated or regulated. If you deregulate the fees, then, you know, getting into a medical, uh, medical admission, MBBS admission in AIMS would be, say, 2 crore for a 5 year, 4 and a half or 5 year program, maybe several crores. Voucher system would fail. 
for IIMs or the best of the universal voucher system would fail. Why the people who have additional income to supplement the voucher, but now the market has been created, right? So all the imperfections, all the drawbacks of a typical market will now be more and more prominent. But the, the, the idea of the education voucher is that education would be publicly funded, but through a route which is not from UGC to the universities, but UGC to the students and then to the university in the process you construct. So this is a problematic structure. Now, when you are talking about, therefore, the university governance, you have to understand that university governance would be undergoing changes from the API to different variations of API. In the API system, what has happened that we, the university, are not being allowed that much freedom to modify API. You don't know what happened in the last, I know it, it may not pertain to you, but still I am sharing with you that how the logic is being played out. In the earlier versions of API, we had the freedom to deviate from the template. Now, our vice chancellor sent a letter to us, which is given by the UGC, emailed to all of us, saying that we cannot deviate from what the UGC wants. That means, what is the logic of the bureaucracy? The bureaucracy logic, the bureaucratic logic is that if, if I give you the freedom, you abuse the freedom. So there is no freedom. That is the logic, right? So when you're moving from input to the output, what happens? So these are the typical feature of the new public management and the output. So the idea is very clear how to, uh, you know, energize the input output function if it doesn't exist. The first is, there's a product format. And these are the three major components of in university output. To educate, knowledge transfer, that is what we do in the classroom and research supervision. Community services and outreach, category two under API. And category three is the knowledge production and also a dissemination to an extent, seminar part participation and all. These are the three. Then output has to be monitored and measured. Competitive ranking. Do you know the, the, the logic behind ranking? One way would be that you measure the university output. The second is that typical neoliberal logic that you know when you're competing, competing based on what? If your output cannot be measured, you cannot compete. So output has to be measured to foster competition. So now you know what has to be produced and how well, how best you can achieve the realization of the vector of university output. So competitive ranking in the sense is trying to generate competition among the universities. And then performance pay and incentive to partner with industry. Industry is coming in a big way for the revision of the course curriculum, for designing of the course curriculum, for funding, for the placement of the students, right? So the university and uh, the industry and the academia should work together. And then you have got the accounting and the audit. Accounting, let me uh, give you an example because uh, this is not the purpose to give you the details of the API. Whatever we produce are being accounted for. But there is no market. How do you account for? If you publish in an international journal, in an example I am giving you, I UGC would give us 35 points. If you publish an article in a newspaper, you get 5 points. What does it mean? It means seven newspaper articles are being treated equivalent to one international article. That is the accounting. The moment you account what we do, they become substitutable. That means it's now playing out in my mind whether I should be writing one good international publication in one and a half year, or I should be writing seven newspaper articles in one and a half year. There lies the logic, there lies the catch, right? And audit means I've already explained, I, IQAC sale and other places that you have. In the process, what happens? This is the typical neoliberal logic. When you talk about neoliberalism, you understand what are they saying? They're saying you have to create manipulatable man. Manipulatable in the sense we can be manipulated. How we can be manipulated? By dangling the carrot and showing us the stick. So that we are the homo economicus and therefore we are engaged in cost benefit calculation. You show us the cost, you show us the benefit. We are rational, well-informed individual. We know what has to be done. That is a typical new level of logic. Now, now, what happens, therefore, we imbibe that logic and turn out to be very different individuals. If you read this sentence, 
as various fields of inquiry are standardized, rendered equivalent and more readily reordered, cost saving and revenue raising are made primary to knowledge creation, but I am sorry, th this is not the slide that I, I mean, I think I have missed it out somewhere. The, the idea was that we become all together, it affects our zone of, zone of imagination, it affects our thinking and we become all together different individuals. Now, the entire story can be looked at somewhat differently. When the academia ought to be enjoying academic freedom, the government and the society had complete trust on the universities to deliver. So that was normative trust. The moment trust is undermined, compromised and you know trust has not been respected as the policy makers would say, we are repressing trust by rational and instrumental trust. That is what is happening through the API. So it's a, it's a, it's a trust that is, is, is important here. Now, what are the problems with the market for education? That is the typical neoliberal logic. The market for education is a, is a problematic for two, I mean, there are many reasons, but one major reason is that the merit and the margin are to be compromised. In a typical education market, what you do in micro, where only the money that you have matters in what you want to purchase, merit does not come into the picture. The typical example I very often give it to the class that if I want to buy a BMW, 60 lakh, 70 lakh, whatever, as long as I have the money, I do not question myself whether I can drive a BMW. It is a matter of one or two days as long as I am driving, driving other cars. So I go and buy BMW, I buy Audi, only the money matters, merit does not come. But in education what happens? Merit is very important and that is why there are admission tests before we are admitted to engineering institutions, medical institutions, gain admission to universities. Merit is very, very important, capability as measured by the admission test and the people at the margin of the society because education is not a chocolate that we can afford to do away with. Education is so fundamental to each one of us to living life with dignity that you cannot ignore the question of the concern of the margin. So therefore, we cannot really ideally cannot think of an education market where merit and the margin will be overwhelmed by the money and that is the problem with the deregulation of the fees. But suppose if my father could afford to send me to Ames for doing a medical and he had 3 crore, then I would have become a doctor, of course a very bad doctor because I did not have the ability to become a doctor. But this is the problem with the market. That means merit and the margin can be overwhelmed by the money. And then, uh, you know, the other problems are there, information asymmetry and many other problems, which I am not going to talk about it. Now, when you are moving from the centralized to the decentralized, that you are bringing the students in. A couple of minutes more? Or? Yeah, five, five, ten minutes more, five minutes. When you are moving from the university to the students and you still believe that the students have to be financially supported, then what are the options you have? Promote education loans. Fees are deregulated, fees would be high, but nobody is saying no to you. Go and take loans. It happened in I am uh, this uh, Bangalore director. When the fees were raised a couple of years ago, they said they have raised the fees by two to four lakhs. Where would the underprivileged students go? They said, what is the problem? Employability, uh, the placement is almost 100 percent. Let them take loans. It is an investment for them. That is what the human capital theory is talked about, Baker and Schulz. So what is the problem? You go and take loans. But generally, it is believed that since in the absence of a collateral, it is an imperfect credit market. So there are problems because, you know, investment in education is a series of decisions that as a student you have to take over the years. So your choice of the courses, choice of the university would be distorted if you know that you cannot afford to pay lump sum amount of money for getting admission to a coaching center in Kota and then subsequently to IIM and IIT. 
because the aversion to loans, risk aversion is also not uniform for everybody. It, it depends on the family, the, the, the financial uh, health of the family, you know, the socio-economic background of the people. So therefore, there could be distortions in decision making in terms of gender, caste and region when you are promoting education loan. The education loan is not doing well also in US. In Australia, there has been some experimentation called income contingent loans. And now there are people from Australia and other places trying to promote income contingent loans here. It means that if you get a job, you pay the loan back only when you get a job. A job which would ensure a salary beyond a certain limit. That is, it is contingent upon earning income. Otherwise, you do not have to pay the loans back or you promote scholarship. <coughs> now, when you are talking about market construction, generally what we do, we are looking for giving more sovereignty to the consumer and the producer and the consumer is the choose to provider, freedom to choose the provider, the university, freedom to choose the product. Choice based credit system uh, is also a part of this that you choose courses and you can combine. Then you provide adequate information on prices and quality. Do you know this uh, Mr. Kapil Sibbal instructed the private universities to put it on their website about the cost and the facilities that they would provide. They can mislead the student, they do mislead the students. It is very difficult to provide information about education quality. It is called an experience good. Unless you go through the process, you can never know the quality. But it is a part of the policy decision and then direct and the cost recovering prices. Freedom to the producer. Government is under pressure to give more freedom to the producers and when it comes to the entry into the market to offer what they want, basically market oriented courses to offer product, freedom to use available resources. That is also a debatable point. You remember this foreign education bill that was discussed but you know still in the limbo. The foreign education bill was talking about that you make surpluses but you will have the freedom to use the surpluses as you want. That means this is the third. So you will see that how each one of them could be made relevant in the Indian context and freedom to determine the prices. Okay. Impact of globalization is very much on us uh, when we are trying to deliver, reform the university system and connect university with the society in much more meaningful manner. One is that they are setting the agenda for us. There are also developments of standards and guidelines, goals and competition. The global ranking is a glorious example of this. Policies have been moved up. We might be, we were under pressure to listen to GATS. We are still under pressure to listen to the GATS. Move down to the institutional level, IQAC. So you can see that how policies are being taken by different agencies. Move to the side by NAC. So therefore, there are many spheres of policy making. It is not only one sphere. And this new public management is also the pushing the university to become actors. You know, the here is a president of the university. They are actually the decision makers, like the CEO of a corporate sector. You have to take decision. You have to mobilize funds, talk to the industry. It is much more than what a VC does for a publicly funded university. They are the actors, if you have to act, because the market has been created for you. So in a market, you can't remain passive. You have to act. You have to gather the information and strategize. And therefore, the VC rectors and the deans, they would cease to become first among equals, but very strong will corporate entities. I don't know whether it would be appropriate to share with you. Uh, in some central university, let me not mention, this is happening. Earlier, the senior most faculty member would become the head of the department as a rotational basis. Now, the vice chancellor is asking those who would become the chairperson or the head of the department to meet him or her and to write on a piece of paper what he or she would like to achieve for the department over a period of two to four years. That means they are being interviewed by the vice chancellor. Why? You tell us what you want to do. Very often we just move files and somehow maintain the functioning of our department. But now, because the university is becoming an actor, the VC has to act and VC is asking us to act. And one major problem with the university governance that is a very loosely connected system. Various departments and all of us are autonomous. As Professor Salim is and I am also autonomous. 
and therefore the VC would have the difficulty to, to negotiate with the respective VC to Professor Salim as well as to me. They are loosely connected system. It's a very very difficult system, and therefore they are become a very strong will, just like the CEOs, because they have to act. What are the problems of the new public management? Uh, the problems are basically it compromised with academic freedom. It does deliver. Very often the government officials have told me after I spoke that look, you, you critique NPM, I understand, but look at the output being generated by the university. It has witnessed a steady rise. Don't you see that? I said, of course I see, but what is the quality of output? What has hap happened to the teachers and the students? But that apart, when you are making a template that this is how we should be producing, and given the fact that there exists a tremendous amount of diversity, what essentially you are trying to do, that this template cannot be customized, keeping in mind the individual specific need, discipline specific need, and the university specific need. This is the problem. That within the social sciences, economics and all other disciplines cannot be treated at par in terms of the projects, in terms of the publication. But there is just one template. It's been discussed that whether the translation of books by the School of Language in JNU should be given points, should be assigned points by the IQC sale of JNU. They're saying that it's not mentioned in the gadget. How can you give you points? But those who are teaching languages, they translate books. It takes years, and it's a creative enterprise. And UGC and JNU has taken time to respond to this particular problem. Because this is the problem, that you have got a template, you honor that template. The moment we are told that we are put under surveillance, the motivation which comes from within are replaced by the intrinsic motivation, which is the, uh, the teachers and the doctors should have, ought to have, are being replaced by that we are being monitored from outside. So let us remain accountable to the outside agency, IQAC and the UGC, so the motivation from within would, would, would fall. And this is quite dangerous for the education system that when you are not motivated from within. This is a typical psychological thing and it happens in parenting. The moment I am made accountable, I look at the target and deliver and what I could have done on my own being motivated from inside would be relegated in the process. No guarantee, NPM and all. <coughs> The last point that I would like to discuss with you, this is, I don't know whether you have heard about this. This was in Delhi paper a month ago. If I have spelled it correctly, Higher Education Funding Agency. The minister gave a press note and it was all mentioned in the newspaper. Somehow it has not got enough attention in the debate. What the university, what the UGC is trying to do here, look at the way they are also trying to combine funding and governance. They're saying that if universities are willing to spend resources for capital under the head capital expenditure, for expansion under the capital head, let them approach an agency to borrow and then spend. The interest will be paid by the MHRD to the funding agency, but the capital will be paid by the universities to the agency. That means the capital have to be generated by the universities over a span of 10, 20 years, the loan period. UGC is not saying no. UGC is saying that I will pay only the, or your interest payment. You borrow, but the capital, 10 crore, 100 crore, 200 crore, you pay. Right? Now, how does a university pay? University has to raise resources from various other sources, including the tuition fee. It is very much well mentioned. The moment you are asking the universities to compete for funds, have the vision and spend on resources, the pressure will be on the students and various ways of compromising with academic freedom because every new source of funding means some kind of compromise by the university. And so therefore, there will be a differentiated system that though university can compete, can raise resources from the will of students or from other sources, would be able to expand and move ahead and would have a larger share and the universities those who would not be able to raise fees for various other reasons would not be able to compete with the other universities. But this is how we are also being made to feel that you are under pressure that you better raise resources. And the last slide about the PPP. Uh, I will not uh, elaborate on this. I think I have spoken enough. But here also we will see that what is the logic of public-private partnership. That you reap the gains of technical efficiency by doping in the private sector. At the same time, you provide the public funds. So public and the private would get together, 
So, it is a public good you recognize, but the public sector cannot deliver the technical efficiency. So, therefore, you broke the private. So, there could be different models of how the public and the private sector can work together and you will see that the governance will automatically undergo changes and most probably it will be in the line of the private sector. So, the issue is therefore, the true universities have failed to deliver. How do you reform? Mode of funding is an important way the countries are thinking about it because we understand in the age of massification, public funding has to continue, but at the same time you want the university to deliver and the problem lies in the sphere of the university, how to rejuvenate the students and the teachers and how increasingly you should make accountable to the market. So, you change the mode of funding and so therefore, it is like an injection you give, but then in the process what happens, universities undergo changes, market is constructed and we deliver. But that comes at a very high cost. Why? Because in the last model, forgot to share with you at that point of time. If the universities are completely geared towards the market, then the market is embedded in the society, but the market cannot articulate all the societal concern. It is impossible. So, everything is geared to the market means that university society linkage at various other points would be badly compromised. Right? So, there would be a lot of cost if you are trying to rejuvenate the universities through this system. But the neoliberals are gaining upper hand because they are saying that, look, you have abused your freedom. You better deliver. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chandrabhya, for the highly enlightening address that was primarily laid out against the nuances of intellectual thinking by Adam Smith, Webblen, Samuelson, and the contemporaries. He brought us to the real world situation. Uh, we have two more presentations, but before that, I think it will be comfortable if we can take a couple of questions at the end of the session. Okay. So, the Okay, then we will proceed with the presentations. I uh, now invite uh, Arunjit Lal. He is heading the Department of Economics and Government Arts College to Band. Arunjit, I think 15 minutes should be okay with you? Or ah. It is very unethical to put a time bar on scholarly voices, but situation demands. This is okay. We were keen to listen to you. Respected Chair, Honorable Speaker, all teachers, and scholars, and dear students, my paper is not uh, related to the financing of education. It is something related to the structure of education. Actually, my presentation was yesterday, and uh, due to some practical problems, it is postponed to uh, this day. And so my paper is on uh, higher education and uh, the labor market in India, some missing linkages. And uh, we know that the theories on education and economic growth have established that human capital has a positive and uh, significant effect on economic growth. And the neoclassical econo economist, especially Zolo, has shown that economic growth could not only be explained by capital and labor increase, but also by the contribution of factors of production and uh, technical progress. And the theory has been extended by 
incorporating the process of capital formation by Mankiw, Romer, etc. As we know that the globalized regime has changed the growth environment. Even with a growth rate, high growth rate, many countries including India face the paradox of mounting skill labor shortages coexisting with the rising graduate unemployment and underemployment. So here, an analysis of the relationship between education, which provides the human capital, and employees, employers, specifically the labor market, who utilize the human capital is relevant. So my paper is an attempt in this respect to analyze the relationship between the human capital providers and the human capital utilizers. So we have the following areas of discussion. The first uh, session, the current state of Indian higher education system and assessment, a very brief assessment. And the second is the emerging labor market changes. And the third aspect relating to the labor market implications. That is the missing linkages between linkage between higher education and labor market or employment. And the fourth area is uh, the strengthening of regarding the what is the way out, the strengthening of the link between higher education and la labor market strategies to follow. So, regarding the review of uh, an assessment of the state of high Indian higher education system, we can see that, so we have, India have by 2030, 140 million people in the college going age group. Only in every four graduates in the world will be a product of Indian higher education system. This is according to uh, the higher education system in India vision 2030 and when we assess the higher education system in India we can see that India Indian higher education is prominently placed on the global higher education map on account of the student enrollment and the number of institutions so we have uh, 33,723 institutions, you, can, you see that. And in terms of uh, the student enrollment, it is uh, 26.7 million. So, so this is the, uh, so that is prominently placed, India is prominently placed in terms of the student enrollment and uh, the number of institutions. but. Uh, at the same time, the, system, the education system lacks in terms of uh, the global ranking of education institution. Uh, you see, so this is the ranking of uh, education institutions. So, so we have, in, in the case of the number of institutions, only six and four. So you compare it to, compare, uh, please compare to other countries. So. So this is, a, this is a brief assessment of uh, uh, the higher education system. So we are prominently placed in terms of uh, the student enrollment and institutions, but we lag in terms of the global ranking of the institutions and at the same time, the international students coming to India and the collaborations with the international institutions. This is the, this is the, 
uh, the picture of higher education system in India. Then uh, the second aspect is uh, regarding the emerging changes in the labor market. So we can see that uh, the emerging changes in the labor market First, uh, first of all, we see that is the emergence of a global labor market. Yeah. Emergence of a global labor market. The structural shifts in the global economy, the productivity enhancement, and the technology progress are driving the demand for a highly skilled innovators and knowledge workers. The world is at the beginning of a fourth industrial revolution. So, and we stand at the brink of a technical, uh, technological revolution that may fundamentally alter the way we live and work. So we have developments in genetics, intelligence, robotics, 3D printing, nanotechnology, etc., etc. So what is required is that the education sector should uh, should uh, supply or should satisfy what the global labor market needs and not the uh, not the local labor market needs. So that, uh, that, that change should be incorporated by the educational institutions. And uh, there is a report uh, uh, that is by the World Economic Forum, a report uh, based on what the changes in skills and employment, what are the different drivers of this change in skill and employment, they have identified uh, the technological drivers of change and uh, the demographic socio-economic drivers of change and they have conducted survey on uh, among the chief human resources and strategy officers and other uh, uh, senior talent and strategy executives of leading global employers, employees res representing more than 30 million employers across nine broad industry sectors in 15 major developed and emerging economies. And uh, what are the drivers that you can see that uh, these are the technological drivers that alter the business model or the employment front globally. We can see that. And you may see the what are the demographic and the socio-economic drivers of change. And collectively, the technological disturbances are significant drivers. And the technological change gives way to change the world of work, that is, new forms of work are generating globally. So, we are towards a global labor market and driven by the socio, demographic, economic and technological factors. The second thing in the labor market changes, we can see that uh, the changing nature of employment, that, that is the gap in the labor demand and supply. According to McKinsey Global Institute, the global labor force will grow to 3.5 billion in two, by 2013. Almost 90% of the labor force growth will be in developing economies including India and China stimulated by demographics. And at the same time there is a farm to factory shift.
creating more employment in the non front jobs and so you see when employments are generated in the non farm sector so it is technology driven and uh, there is what a demand for sk highly skilled laborers and naturally that may generate an imbalance in the labor market through changes in the supply and demand and wages also this same institute has given the significant imbalances the globalized scenario the global scenario of the imbalances you can see the imbalances a shortage of about 30 to 40 million high skilled workers a shortage of 38 to 40 million high skilled workers that is 30% of 13% of the labor demand second a potential shortage of nearly 40 million medium skilled workers which is 15% of the labor demand and lost a potential surplus of 90 to 95 million low skilled workers this is the global scenario given by the mckinsey institute say so, come to the indian situation we can see that uh, india <coughs> fall in the third category a uh, large quantum of uh, the low skill laborers and what about the distribution of labor force by level of skill in india you can see that uh, among the total labor force 27 percent was illiterate 40 percent have below secondary level of education and about only 11 percent among the non agricultural workers have formal or vocational training this is the this is the skill the uh, skill position of uh, the labor force in india so we have what the supply of what over supply of uh, low skilled laborers and at the same time globally we have a demand of uh, the high skill laborers so that may have naturally have i uh, imbalance in the supply and demand and the third labor market change i would like to stress is the declining share, share of labor income and uh, there is a rising inequality and two sorts of inequality have been mentioned by the scholars first is the rising income inequality which is associated with the erosion of labor market in institutions that is growing gap between the top income earners and the middle and the low bottom and the second is the inequality associated with the, the rise in the share of capital and all you know that uh, thomas piketty in his book capital in the 21st century cited the rise in the share of uh, rise in the capital share of income in rich countries so two sorts of inequality can be can be seen and uh, in the in here we are discussing the inequality that is re related with uh, the rising share of labor labor share of income and in the case of india we can see that share of wage in the national income fell from 40% at the start of 1990s to only 34% by 2010 and much sharply in the organized sector from 69% to 51% in the same period so the labor market due to this structural changes have an inequality due, due to a changing share, share of labor income 
and uh, so this is the second part of my discussion so we have uh, we are uh, experience or the labor markets are experiencing a change globally as well as regionally and uh, so what are the labor market implications labor implications so what type of a linkage, a missing linkage? Here we can see that uh, the missing linkage is just between higher education and uh, labor market. <clears throat> and the first aspect we can see that uh, there is a mismatch between graduate skills and labor market needs. This is the first uh, missing link. And as a result of the mismatch between the graduate skills and labor market needs, there is growing unemployability. It is not. Uh, Unemployment, it is unemployability of educated labor force. That is, as per estimation, it is said that by 2025, India's demographic dividend is expected to contribute 25% of global labor force, of 25% of labor, labor growth. 30 lakh people, graduates, will join in Indian job market every year, but only 5 lakh will be okay, sir. 5 lakh will be considered employable. CEOs. And uh, according to NSDC, National Skill Development Council, the growing skill gap in India is estimated to be more than 25 crores workers by 2022. And this skill cap is what more staggering among certain disciplines. You can see that uh, this is the estimated uh, percentage of estimated uh, unskilled workers. That is, uh, among the engineering graduates, 90 percent, IT graduates, 8, 75 percent, manufacturing, 55, health care, 55, banking and insurance, 55. So, the implication is that. Uh, the labor market needs mismatch between the uh, <coughs> graduate skills and the labor market needs. And uh, the second aspect is that uh, the lack of industry academia linkages. And this is a uh, uh, what a case of collaboration. Collaboration can be at the three levels. There is a producer consumer interaction. An industry can provide input back to the academic institution regarding their proportion or evaluation of their products. So that is a kind of what collaboration, that is the product consumer interaction. And uh, this can be applied in India, this can be applied in the engineering education also. And uh, collaboration in continuing education, possibility for academic faculty and institute to conduct uh, training in topics of interest of industry. That is the collaboration in continuing education and at the same time uh, uh, the collaboration in research. This is the what way which uh, we can have a what uh, the industry academia linkages and uh, what are the uh, alternatives. Uh, so only a little more time so uh, to go uh, to uh, little fast that is and uh, how to make uh, how to strengthen the <coughs> uh, like higher education sector and uh, uh, the labor market or the employment so we have a move towards a student demand driven system we should have a uh, uh, student demand driven system that is uh, <coughs> It become uh, the higher education system must become more efficient uh, responding to market needs, employees and government. That is, there is a fine tuning of what the demand and supply. And uh, the relationship between the education and the labor market becomes more direct. This is uh, practiced in uh, UK and um, it is very successful in uh, other advanced countries also. And the next uh, we can see that uh, the second strategy is the need for a globally relevant and competitive higher education system. So we can see that there is a transformation from the world of knowledge to the world of work. And the main purpose of the university education should be work the readiness. Employability has to be considered as a key factor in the curriculum design. 
So we should have an education system that is not best in the world, that should be best for the world. And the third aspect is that strengthen inter industry higher education linkages. And uh, <coughs> so another, the new endeavors of training programs, bridge to employment, etc. Then initiatives for skill development and uh, entrepreneurship and uh, the Ministry of uh, Skill Development and Entrepreneurship have uh, uh, set up uh, different uh, initiatives that is the national uh, nat uh, agencies, National uh, Skill Development Corporation India, then um, National Skill Development Agency, etc., etc., to promote the uh, skill development. And uh, but uh, we have uh, Rosa, then ASAP, many problems, many, many, many things we have. But the problem is that uh, that doesn't have any coverage, and that is given to the students, and students uh, doesn't doesn't know how it has to be what implemented. So that that all the problem pro problem uh, programs implemented by this uh, agencies are it's a total failure, I think, and. Um, uh, there is Anna, we have uh, you have one more session about uh, a detailed session about uh, skill development and uh, I think that uh, sir will uh, will deliver uh, detailed uh, <coughs> aspect about uh, all these things so I would like to uh, summarize the aspect that uh, so uh, the growth uh, uh, environment, in the globalized era has to be translated into what the labor market and uh, across the world higher education is linked to higher levels of employment and life evaluation making it the proverbial ticket to a great job and a great life thank you Thank you, Anjit Lal, for that illustration on the linkages of higher education and uh, the labor market in India. But I understand that uh, Professor Simon Chadavatya has to leave at 11.30. Um, so, I hope you can take a couple of questions. Some. Be very specific. And uh, I think and you can wait a little until such response. Okay. Please. It should always be good if you identify yourself and raise uh, the question. Please. So myself, uh, Dr. Dayal Kumar. Uh, so my question is, uh, so we, have, we are planning to have 10 plus 10 world-class universities. Uh, there is a dream. Uh, <coughs> Uh, our uh, finance minister has spelled out in the last budget. So with, with uh, such kind of institutions, what will happen to the traditional universities at present we are having? Uh, because uh, less than 20 percent of the uh, output of the universities are getting employment in the respective disciplines. There is a current statistics that is available. So there will be pressure on that 20 percent uh, once you have uh, uh, such institutions mostly funded by corporates, PPP or uh, direct funding by the corporates. That is one question. One more question I am having. Uh, so uh, what will happen to uh, the quality of input? So once, once these institutions, they draw uh, quality input from our, uh, our country, what will happen to the quality of input to uh, the rest of the universities? That is quality, of quality of input because uh, world class institutions when you start naturally uh, students will be interested in uh, joining such institutions so naturally the input quality of the remaining universities uh, will be suffering. Excuse me sir, I am Vijay Sri from Department of Economics. Uh, in one of the newspaper articles by the Hindu, uh, your comment was noted on the bureaucratic outburst of uh, on you know pro policy making and organizational uh, things in educational policy. So, uh, whether we follow an input method, input based assessment or output ba output based one, every time we have such a uh, bureaucratic control over this organizational bodies, 
so uh, their viewpoints will be different from that of an educationalist viewpoint so how far such a mismatch can be adjusted between, uh, be, uh, between the policy goals of a bureaucrat mm. their envision will be different from what uh, a, a real academician will be having so uh, there was such a comment on uh, your one of your comment was noted on the hindu newspaper i remember mm. Mm. so how far even if we follow an output or input whichever method we follow so how far this can be solved hi sir so my question is to professor chatopadhyay this is with uh, reference to education as a market so from your presentation we could infer that uh, education market is highly asymmetrical so can you do you think that the adoption of a more unified uh, national curriculum or at least a reduction in the margin of reservation w will it address the scenario so that we can alter the quality of output thank you Sorry, yeah. Uh, hello yeah here yeah. reservation the question was in reservation how will you just reservation reduction in margin of reservation or at least adoption of a unified huh. national curriculum yeah, across yeah. various disciplines huh. How will you respect? Yeah. Yeah. Sir, this is actually a puzzle uh, and a concern. Uh, because, you know, when we always talk about, you know, education, health care, poverty alleviation, etc., the government always says we don't have funds. But when it comes to defense, government says defense, you know, money won't be a problem at all. And, you know, the more worrying aspect is academics. They also, you know, uh, harp on the same string thing, saying that, you know, and economics has become a kind of religion and no more a science. I think that was the last question. Uh, sir, 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 one more question, one more. sir. Sir, um, from here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sir, um, you talked about uh, education. Uh, in your EPW article, you talked about education uh, rather than uh, narrowing it down to an instrument of bettering the person, living standards of a person, it should, uh, education should come with a social commitment. So where is that particular question being addressed? Because the, per the solution that we are offering is more public investment in education, but more public funds are going to a sector that is probably centered on market-oriented education system. So even the curriculum is based on such a system. So uh, where is the social commitment factor coming? Uh, that is my question, sir. All are very difficult questions. One more question, sir. Okay. Yeah, so you talk about the uh, input base funding and uh, <coughs> uh, my question is, the, is that uh, you actually um, stimulating the universities to, uh, to, to have a lot of students, uh, to produce a lot of students. So, but when you think about the employment rate uh, out, what are the imp uh, policies that you implement maybe to to reduce the rate of qualified uh, students in the society. One, one sorry, last sentence, one second. What are the pro uh, policies uh -huh. that you implement uh -huh. to reduce the, the rate of qualified students? Rate of qualified? Yes. Rate of qualified students? Yes. Rate of qualified students? Rate of qualified students who are not employed. Who are not employed. Okay. Yes. Mm. These are the difficult questions we are still struggling <laughs> to answer. Okay, I can't uh, answer all the questions. Uh, first of all, the world class university. <coughs> that is what I briefly indicated that, you know, uh, the government is in a dilemma. In a democratic country with bewildering diversity and the government is actually in a dilemma. Government at one point of time would be coming up, would be willing to come up with universities which are we don't feature in the global ranking, it's a sort of it's hurting our self-esteem. So we want to dedicate resources, give them utmost freedom, assuming that the existing universities are of not, not much. But you know, the, uh, I think the NHRD would be asking the universities to apply. That is also a part of the system, existing universities. But they'll be treated very, very differently. Uh, so the idea is that not all universities, because Higher education, the problem is that one point that you have already indicated, which I forgot to mention in my uh, talk, that I don't know, this market is based on selective efficiency. Input, uh, human quality, the uniqueness is embedded in us. It's not reproducible. 
So the moment you have selective efficiency, then the students and the teachers are joining and the university is also attracting the best minds, that the hierarchy is inevitable. So the input quality that you're mentioning, it's a part of the system. That's why even in US, 1900, 1950, 2000, if you look at the world ranking of the universities, the best would always remain at the best. You know, some changes are there, but within 10, within 20, they would be. So it's a, it's a problem that, you know, it's a part of the system, but the government is now, at the global level, government is also under pressure. We have to feature, we have to, you know, attend to the need of the corporates. At the same time, we have to be inclusive. You have to win election. You, you can't give that signal. So the government is trying to balance between all these objectives. And in the process, what is happening, a more and more differentiated system is being created. The government, I believe, is in dilemma. The government cannot, it can be a lip service, it can be a token, tokenism, whatever. But the government is in a dilemma. And that's why at one point of time, you will see that you know, the market is being generated, private sector is being roped in, the global world-class universities are being, at the same time, you know, they are doing something, or the, but the existing system will be under pressure, both for resources, as I said, HIFA and all, as well as for all other things. Because the differentiated, the, it's, a, it's a problem, you know, differentiatedness in the cell market, in, in the cell phone market doesn't really count. You know, we, we carry cell phones of different, uh, this thing, uh, how does it matter? It matters for education because the degree is the same, but the quality that the degree reflects, depending on the brand and the quality of the institution, is different. That's why even if you have got a B.Tech, M.Tech, whatever, and you are going to the labor market, you will be treated differently. So the degree cannot actually reflect. The degree also reflects the brand of the institution. And that's why the differentiated system is very, very bad. You can't do much. It's inherent into the system because of selection-based efficiency. But to an extent, the government also should not be accentuating the differentiation that exists in the system. It's actually, you know, that is how. Uh, the bureaucrats actually, you know, uh, when I was listening to uh, Professor Rajan Gurukul yesterday, uh, you know, he was talking about the bureaucrats. You understand? You remember, the bureaucrats would do whatever they want to do. You do whatever you want to do. There will be a completely mismatch. So on papers, education policy would be talking about many things, but the bureaucrats have got their own. If you talk to the bureaucrats, the problem is that they would always try to see that you are being pampered, you are being funded lavishly, what is your output? And you, do, you don't work. That's why even in the API system, you will see if you count the number of hours, you are supposed to spend in the office for seven and a half hours per day if you want to fulfill the requirement. That is what their approach is, that you know you also spend eight hours in the office. It's not a creative enterprise. But your point is very valid. Input, output doesn't matter because whatever it comes, they have got a completely different way of looking at the academia. And the tussle is there always. That's why you are, unless you give them the freedom, what Professor Bada Prashad was saying, the block grant and give them complete freedom, and they are doing exceedingly well. So they don't want to give us the freedom because they are thinking that we are abusing the freedom. Your question, margin, uh, I understand that's a problem. Because uh, the way it's progressing, as I said, in a differentiated system, even if you are included, it doesn't matter, right? B because th that problem will remain. See, the economics as a religion, <coughs> or as a policy, economics is a social science and highly ideological. There could be different models, different perspective of looking at the same society. And that's why it is debated, is economics a science? Is economics, you know, can we get some solution? unless we delete at ideological level, and that's why I believe the debate between neoliberalism and anti, it's very pertinent, is very valid. Because the reality is such that unless you make your point very clear, make your perspective very clear, you are not going to deal with the problem. So uh, all, and it's a religion and a practice. See, I think here, I think the role of the economist are, that we have to use economics with a purpose. Even in the second best situation, you know, in the public finance, public economics, there's, an, there's a, always a trade-off between equity and efficiency. So what goal would you like to, you know, in the second base situation, we are not in the first best, you know. In the second base, the government can say we'll be pro-equity, the neoliberal would say the pro-efficiency. You remember the debate between Chidambaram and the Sitaram Echuri in the parliament. Sitaram Echuri was talking about adding one more tax rate, 40%. Chidambaram was talking about just one tax rate of 20%. There's a typical public economics, public finance view. You tag one, worry about efficiency. Sitaram was saying, why worry about efficiency? You know, people need more money. 
to spend on education and health. So let us have one more tax rate. So that debate between efficiency, equity, trade-off and all is very, very relevant. And there, I think the economists should have an independent opinion. And there lies the role of the alternative economic center to think differently, challenge the assumption, and make economics more meaningful for the society. Right? So I highly appreciate the initiative taken by your institute, because otherwise the economics has been hijacked. And it's, you know, it's doing. So we have to understand the assumption. Why are they saying? What are they saying? So, and then I can uh, tackle your uh, question. Uh, the, the input, your question was on uh, commitment, uh, social commitment. You see, uh, if you look at the national institution, the national uh, institutional ranking framework and all, that is what I briefly mentioned. Government would like to cater more to the society. That's a part of the category to output also, output, you know, outreach activity. So we are being told that you have to do more for the society through a process, right? Then CSR is there. And then we are also being told to connect more with the society. So both are happening. But you have to, uh, your question is valid because you have to look at the larger context within which the commoditization is taking place. So, you know, you protect some of the systems, so that's also a dilemma that you want Indian universities to cater more to the society and then you're building a world class university. So the approach is very clear. You differentiate the system. These are the universities to cater to the margin uh, the, for, the, for the purpose of inclusion, for the purpose of society. And let us come up with a different set of universities to compete globally. So the, uh, I think to my mind, you know, the government is in a dilemma in a democratic country. This is how the dilemma is being resolved. That you differentiate the system. Differentiation of the system is the price that you have to pay in the process. I, I, I don't know whether I can have answered all the questions, but this, some of the questions are difficult. Your question was an input, no? Uh, what was it? Sorry. I noted it down. Employability. Huh? Employability. Employability. <coughs> Employability. Employability, you know, one thing is that the quality of education. Second thing is the mismatch that just now we have listened to him. Yesterday also we have listened to him. So how higher education is going to uh, respond to the challenges. And he was talking about bring the industry in and we can and there also lies the importance of what education is for. So uh, uh, it's, a, it's a big thing. I mean, in, in my university also, we are trying to deal with the issue. What is the role of courses that you are floating? Is it for employment? Is it for changing the individual? Is it transformation of the self? That is the role of education. So what, how we are trying to do about it. But many things are happening at the same time. But uh, uh, in terms of the skill, I believe, when I was listening to Professor Bada Prashad yesterday, how Singapore is so responsive to the demand for skill. And uh, because they have got a very sound, robust primary education system, they are not worried about values. The people are already well paid and all. Uh, but I think the redesigning of the curriculum is very important. There would be some information coming from the labor market, how we can redesign the curriculum so that we can make people employable. And vocational training is a very big thing here which uh, yesterday also it was made clear that it's not picking up in our country in that way. Look at the competence, look at the certificate that the people who are employed in the informal labor market. Very, very low. Very, very low. So we don't have the certificate. People are not willing to also have the certificate. Right? So it's a very, very complicated question. I think you can answer it better. You know? Sorry. Yeah. In fact, the job market mismatch is such a big issue. There was a book by Martin Ford I was mentioning. They are talking about that job cannot be given to all. So now we have to talk about income guarantee scheme for the 30 years uh, period. After 30, 40 years, we should have all of an income guarantee scheme because the jobs are drying out. OK, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Professor. And uh, I hope the entire group joins me in Thanking Professor Simon Tilavutia for his great presence. <laughs> uh, I may now invite uh, Dr. C. Anil Kumar. He is working with the Kerala State Planning Board as a research officer. He is giving a presentation on the performance of marginalized groups in engineering colleges. Please. Respected Chair, a very good morning to all of you. 
the title of the paper is uh, performance aspects in engineering education with a special reference to marginalized groups uh, actually the paper was uh, prepared for the uh, technical session on equity and uh, access to uh, higher education that was yesterday and this is not a detailed research oriented paper but a situational analysis of engineering education in kerala uh, with a reference to students from marginalized groups uh, i have been working in uh, scheduled caste development department uh, for the last 4 years as a research officer and uh, there i come across a lot of students uh, who are engineering dropouts and they requested some financial assistance from the department uh, to complete their degree even after 4 years of engineering study so and uh, thing is that most of them have back papers around 40 45 back papers the total number of papers in an engineering education uh, over a period of time is only 58 and they have 40 45 back papers and even then parents don't know these things uh, they are thinking that their children are engineers and uh, this is a social problem not just an uh, educational problem so i made an attempt to understand the intensity of the issue uh, while i was in uh, department and uh, the title of the paper is performance aspects in engineering education with reference to uh, marginalized groups the stratification of a society uh, to inequality uh, on the basis of caste is found perhaps only in india the indian caste system was characterized by a uh, the indian society was characterized by a caste system even uh, from the days of early aryan settlement the position of these marginalized groups they are in the lowest rank of this classification and this position of these marginalized groups were far below the caste system even in fact they were outside the caste system so the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes the name was first described in the government of india act of 1935 and they suffered uh, economic political educational and inequalities for centuries under the customary rules of hindu social order uh, these uh, marginalized groups were denied right to education right to property right to ownership of land right to employment and the consequences of these traditional restrictions are seen even today in terms of Uh, their educational qualification uh, even in the ultimately in the high incidence of poverty so marginalization is generally used to describe the uh, inability of the marginalized groups to full participation in social economic political educational uh, dimensions of social life the impact of economic reforms on these marginalized groups it can be analyzed through uh, these dimensions and among this uh, education has an important uh, role to achieve a greater degree of social justice and empowerment so the present study confines to the performance of uh, students marginalized students in uh, education so the neo liberal argument is that the interests of the individual are best served by market freedom and minimum government intervention of course go- economic reforms how many has created many opportunities but uh, such opportunities and whom they benefited is a big concern uh, particularly among the marginalized groups so this economic reforms has marginalized the already marginalized groups that the data is already has shown this the, the engineering education in kerala okay the engineering education in kerala the history of en- engineering education in kerala starts with the uh, first engineering college trivandrum engineering college of engineering trivandrum that was in 1930 and uh, 9 at the time in 1981 uh, there were uh, at that time the admission was based on the marks scored in the qualifying examination and up to 1980 and then in 1982 onwards uh, the engineering admission was made through entrance examination in 1981 there were five engineering colleges in kerala with a total intake of 100 and 1100 uh, students in 2015 there are on 82 engineering colleges in kerala 
with around 59,000 engineering seats. Now anyone just who passed the 12th can secure a seat in engineering college. So before the advent of this uh, self-financing colleges in 1991, there were only eight engineering colleges. So this is the total number of engineering colleges in Kerala, nine government engineering colleges, three aided colleges and 170 self-financing colleges and the total uh, number of students uh, seats is around 59,000. And the in government engineering college, they follow a mandatory reservation policy of 65 percentage on merit and the rest 35 percent is reserved for socially and economically backward classes and the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. So in self-financing colleges, the uh, 50 percentage seat is reserved as government merit seat and the same reservation policy is applicable to this 50 percentage and the remaining 50 percentage is management seats. So the concern is that out of the 159,000 engineering seats, more than 65 percentage fail in attaining engineering degrees. Uh, this is the reality. And these, most of these failures is from these marginalized or weaker sections of the society. The failure rate in the significance of the study is that the failure rate in engineering education and employability of fresh engineering graduate is a big question and uh, this led the fresh engineering graduates to move to non-technical areas like BPO, call centers or other uh, small scale jobs even after four years of engineering or technical uh, study. The students from marginalized groups who even managed to complete the engineering degree have uh, failed to get a job in BPO or call center or other uh, technical area because of their various reasons are there. The study made a, a, a situational analysis of engineering colleges in Trivandrum district and employability issues of students from marginalized society. This is a simple analysis of three years engineering pass percentage in Trivandrum district. There are 28 engineering colleges in Trivandrum district and three in government sector and the rest in self-financing sector. See the overall pass percentage is 37 percentage including SC and general and uh, the pass percentage of SC students for the three year period is 7 percentage and that of ST students is only 6 percentage. The situation is uh, more complicated as years com coming. So the analysis that the mushroom engineering colleges in the state are concentrated more on quantity rather than quality of uh, technical education. This is the per overall percentage and uh, the past percentage of SCST students over the three year period. The observations are that the failure rate of engineering college is more among the socially marginalized group that we, th the analysis shows and the students from the marginalized groups are getting admission due as a result of their reservation policy and but they failed to complete the course success successfully after four years. The family background is an important determinant of academic performance and especially in the case of marginalized groups, these family, gr the poor they coming from, the adjustment is much difficult. And now a student can complete an eight year course without passing even a single paper uh, out of the total 58 percentage. That is another issue and and in the case of um, these marginalized groups, students from marginalized groups, poor language skills and difficulties in transition from Malayalam to English medium and poor financial background and poor performance in uh, complex engineering concepts. So these are some of the uh, problems that they, that the study identified. And moreover, the entrance exam uh, do not serve the purpose of it. It is not an effective filter. Students without interest or aptitude are now coming to engineering or medical uh, field. And that is another reason for this large scale failure. And uh, some suggestions are there. Uh, counseling should be uh, given uh, from the very beginning, uh, at least from the eighth standard itself uh, to, or an uh, orientation should be given from the very beginning. 
and the reinstate the year out system that is conditional promotion uh, instead of the present system and soft skill training and uh, in should be given as a part of curriculum and uh, students who retain with the largest number of back purpose could be trained in other technical sessions uh, like a computer maintenance automobile maintenance construction supervisors etc <coughs> and it will be good if a bridge course is uh, arranged in between the entrance exam and beginning of the course this is the okay thank you thank you anil kumar now we can accommodate a few questions responses etc can be from either the two or from both so my question uh, ah, my yes. question is to say anil kumar so could you just tell me your sample population and the methodology of your paper because you actually presented a secondary data then you get ahead with the suggestions and observations in between i couldn't find your methodology and the sample population sir i have a question to arjun lal sir sir yes the question is that you presented in your paper a very relevant topic of the lack of employability the problem is not unemployment but unemployability so what are the measures i need to know what are the measures we can do to tackle the issue of the skill gap or how can we solve the problem of employability so uh, one question uh, to uh, arun lal uh, so you call for a market oriented education reform that uh, addresses the demand supply gap but where is the uh, policy solution for addressing the inherent labor inequality there is a there, there is a, a wage inequality i mean income inequality i mean the average uh, if, if you take a, a work structure uh, the people at the top are earning 100 times more than the people at the bottom so where is the provision to address this particular inequality thank you sir sir i have one more question sir one more question to arun lal sir uh anil kumar sir i'm sorry uh the question is that sir while conducting the survey did you uh, whether the aptitude of students was been a criteria in your questionnaire or after the primary data collection did you felt that the students especially from the marginalized section did they choose engineering out of their aptitude or what were the reasons for the choosing uh, choosing engineering so whether this was made in your questionnaire if so what was the responses thank you So I, I think we can move on to the panelists. First question came to Anil Kumar. So, we collected collected data uh, from all uh, from higher education department and uh, university website. The data has been collected for all the 28 en engineering colleges in Trivandrum district and uh, about the uh, pass percentage. And uh, a telephonic interview was conducted uh, with uh, some selected uh, samples to understand the problems. they faced in engineering um, course of study and what are their uh, problems in uh, in completing uh, data has been collected from all the colleges the second the uh, that is secondary data for the period of 2011 12 blue 13 14 three year period then uh, the second question that the aptitude was not a great not a part of my questionnaire would you like to respond so the first question is uh, relating to employability and employability is different from unemployment so employability means that uh, the graduate or educated people is fit enough to undertake a work or employment so what is required is that the educational system should promote should undertake courses having the multiplicity of that promote the multiplicity of skills so that to some extent that will enable the educated to undertake uh, 
what the jobs that is available in the labor market that is another solution right and uh, another question is uh, regarding the inequality and how the inequality can be addressed isn't it so the in advanced countries the inequality in the labor market reduction in the wage share is due to the deterioration of uh, what is called as institutional arrangements that is uh, specifically the unionization see and what happens is that uh, jobs uh, and uh, incomes are increasing in favor of the top uh, layer of employees and uh, what is required is that uh, there is a labor regulation system that is should be involved in the labor market and the second uh, with, with regard to what the uh, increasing share of what capital so uh, that the solution is that uh, the what the labor uh, the laborers the labor force should be more equipped then to a certain extent it can be addressed that's only the solution but inequality will be there right so shall i invite uh, ms tanita to propose a word of thanks respected dignitaries on the dais most valid invited guests teachers presenters and friends it's my privilege to ha have been asked to propose a word of thanks in this occasion i behalf of iuca department of economics i extend a heartfelt gratitude to professor sirek mathews fellow institute of sustainable development and governance thank you sir for chairing the session and for your valuable suggestions and remarks a big thank you to professor S Chattopadhyay, on his absence, I thank him for his wonderful work on mode of funding higher education, can it reform University of Governance, and for sharing us with his valuable findings and opinion. Further, we are grateful to Dr. G R Alunji Lal, head of the Department of Economics, Government Arts College, Trivandrum, for his work on higher education and labor market in India, missing linkages. Also, I extend a heartfelt gratitude to Anil Kumar, Research Officer, Kerala State Finan Planning Board, Trivandrum for his work on performance of marginalized group in engineering education, a case study. Also, I express a sincere thanks to each one of you for your patient presence and participation. Thank you all. I think we'll be coming back soon for uh, the eighth technical session, which will be on higher education in Kerala. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for the Thank work. you all. We'll be having a very short break due to scarcity of time. Be back soon, please. <laughs>